Good evening, everyone. It's welcome. It's wonderful to be back again with you all. And welcome to my first session on the Jews of ancient Greece. Today, modern Je Greek Jewry is a minor, if not insignificant, community in the diaspora, numbering approximately 5,000 persons, most of them citizens of Greece, speaking Greek and in one way or another influenced by their Greek identity. It is difficult for us to imagine, when we look at this map, a world that of late antiquity, when out of the 10 million inhabitants of the Roman Empire, some 1 million were Jews. The vast majority of our Jews lived in cities founded by Alexander the Great, who lived between 336 and 323 before the Common Era, or his successors, or built according to Greek urban ideals. Which means that Greek Jewish relations, now over three millennia in duration, present the oldest continuous inter-ethnic relationship in history. In antiquity, the Greek world was a world of intense internationalism. But there is sufficient amount of reliable material to allow us, as you can see from this picture, to really catch a glimpse of the Greek Jews in this vast matrix. At times, we are dealing with facts. At other times, we are led into the richer and more bewildering realm of legend and myth, a world that perhaps reveals more than incidents circumscribed by scholars' dates. So let us begin with a story in spring 334 before the Common Era, when Alexander of Macedon crossed the narrow sea that divides Europe from Asia and went to war with King Darius III of Persia, extending his territories to India. In a few years, he had successfully dealt the Persian army its death blow and had put an end to the rule of the Achaemenid royal house in Persia. On the ruins of the mighty kingdom which he had destroyed, Alexander established his own realm. And those 11 years between 334 and 323 BCE begins a new chapter in the history of the ancient world, the so-called Hellenistic period, chronologically set between Alexander the Great and the coming of the Romans to the countries of the East. A Jewish legend that we find in the works of Josephus, as you see here, the Roman Hellenized Jewish historian of the first century C of the Common Era, who wrote first in Aramaic and then translated his work into Greek, actually reflects the almost magical aura surrounding this conquest of Alexander the Great and describes an inevitable first encounter of Jews and Greeks in terms of a meeting between him, Alexander the Great, and the high priest in Jerusalem. Josephus records how Alexander, fresh from conquering the coast of Phoenicia, made his way up to Jerusalem with the intention of punishing its high priests and destroying the city of Jerusalem. At the time of laying siege to Tyre, he demanded of Jadua or Jadus, the Jewish high priest, provisions to feed his army. The actual high priest at this time was Shimon HaTzadik, or Simon the Righteous. And one can see in the Talmud, Yonah 49, how it adapts this story as well. Jadua had replied by pointing out that he was still under obligation to the Persian ruler of the world, who, of course, was Darius. He could not commit treason against his lord, and he refused to comply with Alexander's order. Alexander vowed revenge. So on ascending to the holy city, Alexander went to Mount Scopus, Mount Scopii, the best view of Jerusalem from that side, and from its summit looked down onto the Temple Mount. This was the place that Jerusalem was usually admired from. This mountain, of course, had the best view of Jerusalem from high up. 
And once there, he and his army saw a great procession of priests and Levites being led by the Kohen Haggadol, the high priest who was dressed, as you can see and you can imagine, in his sacrificial robes and wearing over his forehead the diadem on which were, were, was inscribed the tetragrammaton, the name of God. And as the procession approached, the Jews apparently went out of the city to greet Alexander. Alexander horrified his army by suddenly throwing himself prostate to the ground and performing proskinesis, which is sort of this ritual uh, act of abasement reserved for gods and divinely appointed kings. Hardly what one performs towards a priest. And when later queried by his generals, as Josephus' account, of course, tells us, Alexander revealed that before he had even passed into Asia, when he was still in Macedonia, he had received a prophetic dream in which the high priest appeared, advising him to take courage and to cross over into Asia. Alexander claimed that the figure he had seen in his dream, dressed as the high priest, had been the very God of the Jews. Obviously, as we know, the high priest was not God. But the legend says that because of this, Jerusalem was saved. And we even have an Italian painter's depiction of this in the 18th century. According to most scholars, it's highly unlikely that Alexander ever made it to Jerusalem. He was too busy conquering the world to bother with an insignificant inland people living around a small temple. But it is still, I think, a great story, a foundational legend or myth about the Jews in Greece, and it was recorded by Josephus. Of course, then, the death of Alexander represented a watershed moment in history. The creation of the Hellenistic age, the new world was divided into successive kingdoms. Judah, now called Judea, lay at the boundary between two of these Greek successor kingdoms, the Seleucids in Asia Minor and the Ptolemies in Egypt. And on the map, you see them as both orange and pink. Fortune favored first one and then the other, and Judea remained this buffer state between them. And from this moment, we begin to witness a continual emigration from the Holy Land, which will cause the flourishing of Jewish communities in the diaspora. And we don't actually know what caused Jews to leave Judea in the early Hellenistic period. But it is during this period that the first Jews reached Greece. It was an exciting, insecure, creative world, the fusion of cultures, of peoples and religions. What did the Greek world look like? Well, I want you to imagine Greek colonists pouring into Europe and Western Asia, building cities everywhere. The Greeks, of course, were superb architects. They were sculptors, they were poets, musicians, playwrights, philosophers, and debaters. They staged marvelous performances. They were excellent traders, and in their wake, the economy boomed and living standards rose. Jews enter these cities as entrepreneurs. They were probably tempted with the possibility of trade and military activity and other opportunities, as the author that you see here of the first book of Maccabees writes in verse, one, uh, in, in, in verse 111, Many Jews left Judea freely and by choice, and in that sense were not different from other ethnic groups. So in the next few centuries, we see a steady stream of emigration from Judea into the cities of the Greek diaspora. So knowing that this was in many ways a diaspora 
experience. We should keep in our mind several questions about these Jews that I want us to think about in our first lecture. How was it possible for Jews to dwell in cities not their own? And what were the strategies for coping, accepted and being accepted and participating that were open to them? Second of all, did these vary from place to place in Greece? Thirdly, did their official legal status within the Roman world differ from that of other ethnic minorities? And if so, how did this affect their relationship with these groups? And fourthly, how do these Jews maintain their relationship with Jerusalem? And what we know is that the Jews established themselves quickly into communities which resembled each other closely with similar institutions that united them. They learned the international Greek and they spoke it. And the sheer geographic spread of Jewish communities under the varying ruling dynasties, Hellenistic and then of course Roman, meant that Jews, like other ethnic minorities, had to adapt to quite varied circumstances. Their immigration into these areas continued over the next few centuries, and many places in Greece reveal inscriptions evidencing Jewish settlements. The Roman proclamation under Simon Maccabee alludes to Jews in Sparta, in Sicyon, on the island of Crete, and on the island of Cyprus. By the first century, the, Alex the Alexandrian Jewish philosopher Philo wrote that he knew that Jews lived in Thessaly, Thessalonica, Boeotia, in Macedonia, in Aetolia, in Attica, and in the town of Argos and Corinth, as well as in the best places of the Peloponnesus, as he writes, likewise on the islands of Euboea, Cyprus, and Crete. And if we move forward again to after 70 CE and the destruction of the Second Temple and use the Christian New Testament as a written source, in particular the Act of the Apostles, we hear about Jewish communities in Philippi, in Thessalonica, in Berea, Athens and in Corinth. Josepha too, writing at this time, speaks of the Jewish diaspora in general terms. There is no people in the world, he says, among whom part of our brethren is not to be found. The Jewish race, he says, is scattered over the entire world among the local inhabitants. So what do these Greek cities look like in the ancient world? Well, every newly founded Greek city was in effect a refoundation of an, or, or enlargement of an ancient Greek town. The Greeks of the Hellenistic period did not go out to unsettled and uninhabited localities to transform the desert, to settle ground, and to bring culture to places which hitherto had possessed none. Every Greek city was surrounded by a wall, and this fortification symbolized its independence. In the classical period, Cities were erected by a certain group of people who constituted the city's initial body of citizens. And these cities were conducted according to the rules of democracy. So you see here the manumission sale about Steli of a Jewish slave being given freedom. The whole people, the demos, participated in the exercise of power and everyone had the right to express his opinion in the general assembly of the city. The citizens elected a city council run by the first citizens of the city which decided all questions of agenda. And this right to self-government constituted the outstanding superiority of the Greek town over the village. Now, there were only two ways of becoming a citizen in these Greek cities, by being the son of a citizen or by obtaining citizen rights through a special act of the city council. The number of citizens in each town was not especially large and only the citizens enjoyed all the civil rights while the residents were regarded as foreign born natives, although they might have actually been born in the city and have grown up there. Jews are not citizens. Yet from the economic point of view, the city itself 
was sort of a sort of large village where citizens and non-citizens lived together and worked together. So what do we know about the Jewish community structure? Well, the Jewish communities were small. They lacked any political power. And these communities seem to have welcomed every Jew who came from the outside to settle in the place where that community existed. Whichever city they lived in, they would build a synagogue which served as the communal center of instruction and justice, and even for lodging Jews, having some sort of hostel for those Jews who were traveling through. There was no special judicial term in Greek for the, German, for the, for the uh, Jewish communal organizations, but frequently the Jews were designated simply as Jews or as Jewish residents of the city. And clearly then, the Jews were classified by the Greeks with aliens and people born abroad. And the Greeks officially acknowledged the autonomous organizations of the Jewish community. And we often see terms used for Jewish communities. Polytumia is one of them. Another one is katoika, which was used to describe colonies of people in a Greek city of foreign birth especially maybe of troops in other countries. And at a later period, we see laos, synodos, and of course, the Greek term synagogue, which was really used to denote the Jewish communities. And it seems too that Jews took the models from the political institutions of their cities and used the name of public positions from the cities for public positions in their own communities such as the Archon, the Gerosiash, and the like, as you see here. And even the post of Chazan was called the Nakaros, a priestly title borrowed from pagan temples. Now, let us look a little bit closer at the extent of the archaeological evidence we have of our Jews at this time. Well, the development of a Jewish community required, on the one hand, the means and legal possibility of acquiring or leasing land, that is to say, having some sort of civic standing. But as far as the communities themselves went, it could not have happened without their having a certain sense of being at home, being accepted, at least to a degree, together with the general intention on the part of staying where they were. And it seems that the synagogue or assembly of Jews first took place, as it often does in Jewish communities, we can think of Italy and other places, in households or converted houses. For example, that of Delos that you see here, Priene in Western Turkey, and Stobi in Northern Macedonia. Though it is not suggested that every Jewish community went through a kind of evolutionary process from household organization to synagogue building. The most ancient synagogue in Greece is on the island of Delos. Here we have five inscriptions that date from the late second or early first century before the Common Era. And it is in fact the oldest synagogue known in the diaspora and the oldest of a number of contemporary synagogues throughout the Hellenistic world, including those of Ostia, as you see here in Italy, at Militas, at Sardis and Pirene, as I mentioned before. And if you look for a moment at this fine marble throne and footstool, now referred to as the throne of Moshe, as Moses, there are no indications in this Delos synagogue of either a Torah shrine or a bima or a platform where uh, the person leading or speaking would, be, would, would stand from. What we have instead is this, this wonderful throne where the head of the community, presumably, it was like a special chair for him and it would be where he sat. Some synagogues were located on the outskirts of the city or town. Some were found more centrally, perhaps indicating better integration and acceptance of Jews in the community. And membership of the community usually involved the payment of Jews because Jewish communities needed money. We're still not sure whether there was such a thing as communal prayer in the synagogue before, of course, this destruction 
famous destruction of the Second Temple, so beautifully depicted in this um, Choban film that was made in 2021. But we do know from a Theodotus inscription that is now in the Israel Museum here in Jerusalem, which is the oldest description of a synagogue that existed at the time of the temple in Jerusalem. It doesn't mention anything about a synagogue being used as a forum for, for prayer. And it confirms for us also, because we can see by looking at it, that the Jews are speaking ancient Greek, that they are comfortable with this language. Theodosius, of course, is a Greek name. Most evidence for Jewish prayer is late but it may possibly have been practiced in some form in some of the, uh, the, the synagogues in the diaspora. But the synagogue in the diaspora has to be seen really as a house of study. Orientation of one's thoughts and intentions were guided by orienting the building in some manner or other towards Jerusalem. But even the manner of orientation varied in these synagogues. Some Early synagogues, for example, place their entrances to the east, still others place them to the west or south walls and use something else to mark the direction of Jerusalem. But even niches and spaces for edicules are not always to the east, as one might expect. All that can conservatively be said about these early synagogues in the Hellenistic world is that they reflected local architectural styles, they were orientated in some manner or other towards Jerusalem, had a niche or an edicule that functioned as a ark, as an echal, and provision for a raised platform or bima from which the Torah or the law would be read. So definitely reading of the Torah scrolls was practiced in a pre-70 CE period as attested by both Philo and Josephus. Let's just look at what Josephus says. He indicates that the public reading of the Torah was educational as opposed to ritualistic. And this is in again, his against um, the Appion. And in Antiquities too, he indicates that the purpose of such reading is to inform the Jews of their law and I'm taking the last line here, in order to our avoiding sin. So what is noteworthy throughout this period is the structural variety of the synagogue, which, suge which suggests adaptation, experimentation on the part of these Greek Jews. And second, their ability to work within the broad framework of a spectrum of types of Greco-Roman associations. Creativity in this diaspora was expressed, I would suggest, less in the achievement of compact and cohesive holy communities than in the finding of appropriate forms of existence and through those of coexistence with others who are living among them. We might say that our Jews are pretty good at making communities. Naturally, these processes were not unidirectional. Many diaspora communities, of course, simply disappeared, and we don't know what happened to them. But others became rooted, and many endured. During the centuries of the Greco-Roman diaspora, we can begin to trace the evolution of synagogue designs and patterns, which would be consolidated in Jewry in subsequent periods. Decisive features, including the presence of an apse, an alcove, a niche of some sort, evidently designed, as you can see here in the Dura Europa synagogue, to house scrolls. Mosaic floors known at least in 10 cases. And notice that the whole system of how to decorate a holy place definitely comes from Greek culture. Some synagogues also had courtyards containing a fountain or a cistern, indispensable perhaps in the absence of a neighboring seashore or spring, such as the sites of Aegina, Hamam, Lif, Delos, and Ostia possessed. So scholars believe that the institution of the synagogue 
was among the most notable institution that helped sh uh, really shape the face of the ancient city. And of course, and I told you we'd be using the Act of the Apostles and the New Testament to help us to understand our Jews of ancient Greece, it is significant that Paul of Tarsus, his main journeys, took him into the heart, the very heart, of the Hellenistic world, to the cities of the Ionian Asia Minor, to Ephesus, to Sardis, and on to Macedonia, Thessaloniki, Veroa, Athens, and Corinth. In the New Testament book of Acts, in the city of Philippi, Paul and Silas are said to have gone on the Shabbat to a place of meeting, Jewish meeting together, a place of prayer, situated outside the gate at the riverside. And it is possible that this refers to the synagogue in Philippi, although there are no remains of it in this ancient synagogue. When they get to the city of Thessaloniki, the situation is clearer. No less a personage than the leader of the synagogue, Jason, is said to have given Paul lodgings. Paul is permitted to preach in the synagogue on successive Shabbatot, on Saturdays. And the description of Paul's association with the Jewish community of Athens is brief, but we know of the community from his writings. In the thoroughly Hellenized city of Corinth, Luke introduces a Jewish community and mentions a synagogue that was next door to the house of one Titius Justus. So all of these books are important for giving us evidence of Jewish communities in Greece. Here, Luke portrays an initial positive response to Paul's preaching. He is allowed to preach in the synagogue every Shabbat, even though he's spreading the word of Jesus. Luke's narrative also portrays an openness on the part of the Jews to these Gentiles in the cities of Asia Minor, Macedonia, and Greece. So Jews are clearly learning how to communicate their culture to non-Jews, their apologetics, their oral and literary as well, apologetics, could affect a range of possible results. And we need to attribute to the success of Jewish apolo apologetics the full range of positive responses from toleration to these new Christians, interest, partial imitation, through to full proselytism. And while we cannot quantify the results, the cumulative evidence suggests that the apologetics was of critical importance in ensuring the survival and flourishing of Judaism through the Greco-Roman diaspora. And what we really sense from this is the centrality of the sermon in the synagogue, regular preaching by this time um, in these Greek cities. The main synagogue of a Jewish community was also the place, of course, for juridical acts, such as the emancipation of slaves, which were also carried out in the community, sometimes in the synagogue. And this is indicated by a first century Jewish inscription, the Bosphorus inscription, as it is known, which reports how Jews honored a vow by granting freedom to a Jewish slave in the local synagogue. There is also some suggestion that these buildings could also provide some sort of asylum, a right known to have been fairly commonly granted to temples and shrines by the Ptolemies. And the communities also had special courts here. If we look, for example, to the Tosefta, the supplementary compilation of Jewish oral, oral law in the Mishnah from the late second century, a Jewish court is actually mentioned in Alexandria and another court in the city of Sardis in Asia Minor. So we should note in particular that these building complexes that the Jews built in many ways to safeguard their community was, were multi-purpose. We know that the festivals celebrated in the Holy Land 
are brought to the diaspora. And these included, of course, not only the traditional celebrations, such as Passover, Tabernacles, Sukkot, but also the new festivals that come in, Purim and Hanukkah. So a question that we really have to think about when we're considering our Jews at this point is what is their relationship with non-Jews? The Jewish community relied on certain privileges in order to act as this independent legal unit. The first and most important condition, of course, is that they are not to be obliged to take part in the cult of the Greek gods. In general, I would argue that the ancient world was unacquainted with religious persecutions. No one cared what deity reigned in one's neighbor's house. But religion, of course, has this organic part, and it's part of the political system of the Greek city. And the Greeks knew nothing of the modern principle of the separation of church and state. One was not able to ignore or abandon the official cult of the state, which in the Hellenistic and Roman period took on the permanent form of the deification of kings and emperors. All these things are going to be accepted by the Syrians, by the Tyrians, by the Sidonians, by the Egyptians and others who are willing and ready to receive the Greek and gods into their pantheons without opposition. But these gods are not going to be accepted by the Jews. The God of Israel, of course, according to the second commandment, acknowledges no rival, nor can one pray to him, to any other God, and simultaneously offer sacrifices to another deity. The cult of the gods was in Jewish eyes the complete negation of Judaism. And so the existence of these Jewish communities was bound up with achieving an exemption from the authorities from participation in the cult of Greek deities. Of course, there is no extant document which confirms this extension, exemption for us from the duty of participating in the worship of the Greek gods. And precisely this privilege, the most important of them all, on which the actual existence of Jewry in the Greek world depended, is nowhere mentioned in extant sources. But we realize that the exemption of the Jews from the cult of the gods could not be stated in an official document. For could anyone, whether Greek king, Roman governor or Greek city, write the words, I permit the Jews not to worship and respect our gods? No one could demand of the Greeks that they emphasize this point. Greek kings who ruled certain cities thereby confirmed the status quo and protected the Jewish liberty of worship. In the meantime, at least, until Hellenization kicks in. But there are other aspects of this independent legal status that we should think about in relation to Jews and non-Jews. We also have to appreciate that the Greek world had to take into account that Jews could not transgress their own commandments. It was difficult to observe Shabbat, the Sabbath rest, if there was a need to appear in a Greek court on that day or to serve in the forces. So Jewish communities demanded that an exceptional legal status be introduced on their behalf and that this status be guaranteed to them by privileges under the auspices of the authorities. What about professions? What are our Jews involved in? Well, it seems that Jews served willingly in the armed forces as generals and soldiers especially as fortress garrison troops or in special Jewish battalions, such as that of the Kato Ke of the territory of Onias in Egypt. They were also small peasants, agricultural laborers who worked on the land of others for wages. We know that Jews were also landowners. And if we ask what was the reason for this striving to live in a rural life, the answer is simple. Because in their own native country, among the hills of Judea, they also participated in agriculture, practiced agriculture, and it was natural for them when, abro when abroad 
to engage in the same types of work to which they had been accustomed from their youth. And we also see other professions, policemen, officials, tax farmers, estate owners, craftsmen, merchants, money lenders, and doubtless also members of the free professions such as physicians, scribes, and the like. Some of our Jews are wealthy, and wealth is gathered by in the hands of exceptional individuals who'd been successful perhaps in commercial dealings, tax collecting, but the vast majority, from what we know, lived humbly by the sweat of their brows. And in short, from the economic point of view, there was no difference between the Jews and other peoples among whom they lived, and no single economic branch that constituted a monopoly for Jewish activity in the ancient world. So now let's turn to Hellenization. Well, Jewish life in these Greek cities was not always simple. There was something attractive about Greek Hellenism. It was everywhere, representing opportunity, temptation, and threat all in one. Could the Jews withstand the temptation of Hellenism? Well, we know the Greek athletic life was carried on in a Greek religious setting and was saturated with memories of Greek mythology and Greek classical literature. Philo saw the life of athletics with its physical exercises and various agonistic sports as an everyday phenomenon and found no fault with it. And at the beginning of the Roman period, the Jews made various efforts to penetrate the citizen class. And one of their ways of doing this was to obtain an education in the gymnasium. All these examples indicate the keen ambition of diaspora Jews to emulate the Greeks in the most important branches of original Greek cultural life. And there is no doubt that the education of young Jews in the gymnasia opened the way to a deeper understanding of Greek culture as a whole. But then something happens in the year 270 before the Common Era, which will be influential for our Jews. Ptolemy II, Philadelphus, who was the pharaoh of Ptolemy Ptolemaic Egypt from the year 284 to 246 before the Common Era, the son of Ptolemy I, who had been, of course, the Macedonian Greek general of Alexander the Great, decides from his splendid court in Alexandria that he wants the Hebrew Bible to be translated into Greek. His desire to know the teachings of the Jews caused him to have 70 scribes versed in Hebrew and Greek brought from Jerusalem to do the translation for him. And this becomes known as the Septuagint or the translation of the 70. Most modern scholars believe that the translation was done not because Ptolemy wanted it as much as for the benefit of the Jews themselves. The simple reason was that Egyptian Jews had ceased to understand Hebrew and it was necessary to provide them with the Pentateuch in the language in which they spoke. The Greek language was clearly winning a decisive victory over Hebrew and Aramaic among the Jews of the diaspora. And the translation of the Pentateuch into Greek was this impressive literary undertaking unexampled in the ancient world. As a consequence, it seems now that Greek began to prevail in the official assemblies of the Jewish communities, in literature, and even in daily life. But it was only a beginning. There are abundant works of Jewish Hellenistic literature written entirely in Greek, 
although the overwhelming majority of its readers were Jews. And in many ways, there was also an opposite reaction, as the Hebrew Bible, of course, is now exposed and accessible to the non-Jewish world. This would be the scripture on which Christianity under Paul and others in the apostolic tradition drew their knowledge of Judaism. The new type of Jew who is drawn to Hellenization more than Judaism was to be found in every locality and we have no means of determining their number. It did not make departure from the Jewish world obligatory, but it happened. It happened with Jews marrying Hellenized Greeks, and therefore we are looking without doubt at a period of mixed marriages. Jews who were influenced by Hellenization and ended ending marrying out and marrying into the Greek communities. Philo, for example, even speaking of the Exodus, wrote that the Jews had left Egypt as a mixed mob of various people, born of marriages between Hebrew and Egyptian women. But what he may be describing is exactly what he's seeing at the time that he's writing. The conditions of his time when Jews are actually marrying into Greek society. So there is this threat and it exists. The material shows that the Jews are strongly influenced by Hellenism and sometimes did not muster the strength to overcome this temptation to be like the Greek people. And there was, this was something that really attracted them. But what holds them back? What stops them? Or what allows for Jewish survival even at this moment? Of course, there are still benefits for staying Jewish. Membership in the Jewish community brought considerable advantage from an economic point of view. Definitely it was convenient for a Jewish trader when he's traveling to know that wherever he goes in the world and wherever he takes his wares, he would find his brethren, his co-nationals, people like himself to help him in his hour of need, to furnish him with necessary information on the state of the local market wherever he's traveling, being at the same time, moreover, eager to do business with him than with anybody else. And not only the trader, but also the Jewish craftsman needed this, clo this close tie, which bound all the Jewish communities into one international body. And if we keep in mind that the entire trend of Jewish life at this time outside the Holy Land, the evidence of organized Jewish communities and Jewish life for many generations in given localities and the synagogues scattered over the Greek world, we shall easily see that the diaspora Jews were closely attached to their nationality and that the overwhelming majority of them did not incline to assimilation. Jewish tradition was the foundation on which the Jewish communities were built. And without it, Jews would not have had the right to demand protection of their privileges from the kings and the cities in which they lived. Nor would the latter have found special reason for making exceptions of the Jews from the juridical point of view. Now let us jump a little ahead for what I think is the next important step in our history. The Greek Hellenistic king Antioch Antiochus Epiphanes came to power in 176 before the Common Era. He ruled the Seleucids Empire from 175 BCE until his death in 164 BC. Notable events during Antiochus's reign include, of course, the near conquest of Ptolemaic Egypt, his persecution of the Jews in Judea and Samaria, and the rebellion of the Jewish Maccabees, the Hanukkah story as we know it. Antiochus in Jerusalem inaugurates a policy that is aimed at the forced Hellenization of his kingdom. A gymnasium is constructed in Jerusalem 
and the Greek custom of performing naked in the games is introduced. Priests are found active in these games and even went so far as to have their circumcisions dis disguised. And this was done by a painful operation known as epispas. These feeble and uncomfortable endeavours, however, were not enough for Antiochus. And even after dismissing Jason, he appointed the latter's cousin, Menelaus Onias, as the high priest. As Menelaus Onias' name indicates, he himself was a firm Hellenist. And in 169 BCE, Antiochus set out against Egypt, and there followed a series of wars that almost led to his unifying Syria and Egypt under his rule, but for the appearance of a Roman embassy led by Popilius um, Linus. The Romans, fearing such a union, insisted that Antiochus retreat, and in the course of this retreat, he received news of a revolt in Judea. The success of such a revolt would have destroyed the very buffer that he had been seeking in this area. After seizing Jerusalem and slaughtering the insurgents by the thousands, Antiochus proceeded to issue decrees in which the worship of the Judean God was outlawed. Circumcision was forbidden, and in 168 before the Common Era, the temple was turned over to the worship of the Greek gods and swine, and swine was sacrificed on the altar. Their blood was then spattered on the exposed scrolls of the law of Moshe. And it was in response to these horrors, to the traditionalist Jews, that in 166, a new revolt was led by Judah Maccabees. Aided to a degree by the sudden death of Antiochus, it was successful. And in the following year, Jerusalem was seized and the temple was rededicated to the worship of the Judean God, an event that is commemorated to this day, of course, by us for the festival of Hanukkah. So it cannot be denied that the problems of Hellenization and tradition faced diaspora Jews in a much more acute form than those that really faced the Jews in the Holy Land. The Hellenization of Jews in the diaspora was a continuing temptation. What we've seen in Judea is one specific event. The common symbolic tie of diaspora and Jews remained the homeland, remained um, Jerusalem, for the most part elevated to biblical, mythical status. The temple was still around for our Greek Jews until 70 CE. It was the center of the world, even though most diasporic Jews would not return to live in the Holy Land. And despite the fact that many, such as Philo, displayed both a kind of local patriotism for their native Greco-Roman cities, as well as a love for the temple city of Jerusalem. But even after the Second Temple's destruction, Greek Jews of the diaspora continued to make pilgrimage to the city and to continue to regard it as the ideal burial place. So it was perhaps this continued focus of diasporic Jews on Jerusalem, even more than Torah observance, which ensured that the Judaism of the diasporic cities did not disappear into the melting pot of Hellenism. Again, the book of Acts tell us, or, and this is uh, the book of Acts 2, verses 9 to 11, which I'm particularly looking at, they recall the number of languages which could be heard spoken in Jerusalem, evidence of the presence of some of our Greek Jews some of our diasporic Greek Jews coming to the city from men, the many different places that they lived. And these Jews also donated gifts to the temple. A stone pavement in the temple area was even a gift from a Jew from the, from the island of Rhodes. 
And Philo records how some Jews believed that payments to the temple would guarantee them good health and safety. A notion probably based on the idea expressed, of course, in Schmott, the book of Exodus, in 3012, where the payment is a ransom for the soul. So this connection with Jerusalem is really what we're expressing this, at this point about our Grecan Jews. They keep up their love, their passion for Judaism, they come uh, for Jerusalem, they come when they can, and they bring gifts on their way. Now with this background of our ancient Greek Jews, we can move on more comfortably to the Byzantine times, where more extant sources give us more information on the Jews in the Greek lands. So I look forward to, for you joining me for our next um, episode in this, in this um, series where we'll be looking specifically at how Jews fared and, um, as Greek Jews in the Byzantine times. Thank you. Thank you.